Uh, first of all, everybody, I want to kind of clarify something right up front, and that this is based, this presentation is based off of research on elite athletes. So some of you are trying to teach the spin to five and six year olds. This stuff is not necessarily the fundamental stuff. This is the stuff that is uh, what takes people to higher level performance. So I'll just clear the air here. Don't teach your five and six year olds uh, this type of stuff. So what the basis for this presentation is, as Rob indicated, uh, is the research that I've done on elite level shot players. USA Track and Field was commissioned, uh, excuse me, USOC basically sent down a mandate to US, USA Track and Field and say, we're only going to give you money if you get medals for us. And that directly pours down to the biomechanics. Uh, basically what that means is the biomechanists and all the other sports scientists need to try to find critical factors, that's their key term, for success in the event. Obviously, the objective of this research, or of the project as a whole, is to put U.S. athletes on the stand at World Championship and Olympic Games. So having got through with that, uh, I'll go. Uh, before I get into the meat of the presentation, first, I'll talk about some subdivisions of the pro. This will help clarify later on when we start talking about uh, specific points of technique that we're talking about. A lot of people can break down the throw in different ways. But for the purpose of simplicity, this is the way that I've done it. Uh, so previous research and coaching literature have used support to look at the throw. Uh, they break it up into divisions of support. For example, single support, double support, no support, as in the case of flight or uh, rotational shot put. Uh, using easily identifiable events like takeoff, rear foot touchdown, front foot touchdown, things of that nature, make it easy to examine the event analyze the characteristics of the throw. So again, basically I took periods of single and double support, and this type of approach has been used before to look at the shot put. So getting into what specifically I classify everything as, uh, the pre-flight phase is basically everything before the moment of takeoff. So the, the preparatory line with the turn to the front of the center is the pre-flight phase. The moment of takeoff is pretty simple. It's the instant right before the athlete enters the period of flight. Uh, the flight phase is the period from takeoff to right or rear foot touchdown, right foot touchdown for uh, right handed throw. Uh, rear foot touchdown obviously is uh, when the rear foot gets in the back of the circle. The, the period of time between rear foot touchdown and front foot touchdown I call transition time. So the, the period of time between uh, single support and double support is transition time. And then obviously front foot touchdown is the next event. Completion phase, the second half of what I call delivery. So we have the first half of delivery is the transition, and the second half is uh, the completion. Uh, so the athlete can actually start to deliver the shot at rear foot touchdown, uh, and I've broken it up into early and late delivery depending on the basis of support. Obviously, release is classified as the instant the shot breaks contact with the thrower's hand. So here, just a little schematic so we can kind of get all on the same page and when I start talking about uh, these different biomechanical aspects or characteristics of the throw, you can see up here on the top line, I've got all the events of the throw, for example, the initiation, which is the very first moment the throw has started, take off, uh, rear foot touchdown, front foot touchdown, and release. Those events uh, are used to subcategorize the various phases of the throw pre-flight, flight, transition, and completion. I'm sure half of you in here are sitting here saying to yourself, well, what, what the heck does that mean to me? It doesn't mean very much at all. Again, that was just kind of to, uh, we can all get on the same page as far as uh, 
talking the same language essentially. What you guys want to know is what determines the distance of the crow. Ultimately, it all comes down to the release parameters. <coughs> How good or bad a throw is going to be simply based on these four things. Release height, release angle, uh, release velocity, and horizontal release position <coughs> relative to the board. That fourth one is very often ignored, but when we look at the shot put or any of the other throwing events, the winner isn't necessarily the person that threw the implement the furthest, it's the person that has the farthest uh, mark away from the point of measurement. Everyone see the difference? <coughs> so for example, in the shot put, I could potentially release the shot put one foot behind the toe board and throw it further, but the <coughs> person who has released half a meter in front of the toe board but thrown, actually projected the shot a lesser distance. Clear? Uh, so the first three make up projected distance release height, release velocity, and release angle. The last one is basically kind of a uh, icing on the cake type of thing. If we get all those right, and we get a very beneficial release position relative to the toe board, then we're talking about big throws. A measured distance, as I kind of hinted before, is the sum of the projected distance plus or minus the release position relative to the toe board. Again, you can't release behind the toe board, so you can actually have to subtract that, uh, subtract that distance from the total measure distance. Here's a little diagram just to kind of make clear what we're talking about. Release velocity, what we're speaking of here is basically how fast the shot is leaving the athlete's hand. How fast is leaving the athlete's hand. Uh, the angle of release is measured with respect to the ground, or the horizontal plane. Height of release, Obviously uh, pretty clear there, and you can see here designated by that small D sub 2 is the horizontal release distance relative to the toe board. Before any of you run out now, because I put this big uh, projectile motion equation on the board here, I'm only doing this for one reason. I don't you, you guys don't need to necessarily know what this means, but if you could look at it here, and we just look at the parameters that I just talked about, release height, release velocity, and release angle, and we look at this equation, what we see here is that, just picking out the little Bs up there on the board, you can see that the projected distance or the D sub flight is, a, is very much related to velocity, much more so than the others. It's related to velocity, the relationship is velocity squared, uh, as opposed to with uh, height and release angle. So velocity has a, a, a cube relationship with how far the object goes. <laughs> kind of going along with that, when we look at and break down each of the release parameters, this is, this is part of a meta-analysis I did a couple years back on some biomechanical research. When we look at the effect of release height on projected distance or measured distance, it doesn't really seem to have any effect. You just see this blob there. There's no trend. People who have higher release heights don't necessarily throw farther. All else being equal, they will. But really, there's not too much of a relationship. Uh, we look at Adam Nelson. The guy's not too huge. But he's throwing farther than some of your six foot eight guys. And he's a perfect example of the fact that release height is not necessarily a huge indicator of success in the shot. Release angle, on the other hand, plays a huge role in uh, success or performance in the shot. But it's not what a lot of people think of. So if we look at this picture up here, and I'm not going to go into in too great a depth right now, we'll touch on it later. But what we can see is that as release angle drops, 